this came from the very simple Newton equation, which tells that if you have a big mass, and if you are at a distance r from this mass, the acceleration that you feel is proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. This simple law applies to all the planets and applies also at large to the stars and the galaxies. And I was really fascinated by that, and at that time my great hero became Newton. Newton, who had understood that from apples to stars, every object in the universe obeyed to the same gravitational laws. You know the story about Newton uh, uh, sitting at, uh, uh, near uh, an apple tree and looking at the apple falling and having the revelation that the fall of the apple and the rotation of the moon around the Earth were given by the same equations. I was also aware that another great scientist of the 20th century, Einstein, who died when I was 10 years old, had made a very strange discovery. He discovered that the great Newton was wrong when large velocities were implied, and that correction had to be made, and that very strange thing happened, that the time did not evolved at the same pace depending upon your own velocity. And I knew that he had developed what is called special relativity. And in this theory, you have this very simple equation, E equal mc squared, that everybody knows. I think it's the most well-known equation in physics, which means that any chunk of matter contains a huge amount of energy because C is very large. C is the velocity of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. So when you compute this quantity, you find that there's a huge amount of energy in matter. And this energy is released during, for instance, nuclear reactions. The initial components have a different mass in the final components. And the mass difference is emitted in the form of energy. This explains, for instance, uh, the fact that the sun and, and the stars radiate a lot of energy due to nuclear reaction, and this energy is of course very useful, very important, because it is what makes heat coming to the Earth and makes life possible on Earth. Of course, this equation of special relativity was quite mysterious to me. It was just an equation. I did not understand where it came from. And I had also heard about something even stranger. Einstein had found that the gravitational laws that Newton had described were not the only way to understand gravitation. He made a deeper interpretation, saying that when you have a mass in space, this mass is changing the shape of space around it. The analogy can be made in the following way. You can imagine that space is a sheet which is stretched in an horizontal plane. And if you put a big mass on this sheet, the sh you will have a deep in the sheet, and other mass is going nearby, instead of going on a straight line, will be deflected by this deep, and will start falling on the deep, which is another interpretation of gravitation. This is called general relativity, and of course this sounded beautiful but strange at the same time, to me at the time. Then I had some chemistry in high school, and I learned in chemistry that atoms we are like small planetary systems. You have a positive nucleus and electrons going around. And this looked quite familiar because it was a small planetary system. Instead of being huge like uh, the Earth around the Sun, which is hundred millions of kilometers, it is very tiny, about one billionth, one tenth of a billionth of a meter, but it's a system which looks like a, plan a planetary system. But then I learned something stranger. In fact, the French physicist Louis de Broglie had said that, in fact, the electron was more like a wave going around the core of the atom. And he called that wave events. And this sounds very, very bizarre. And even more bizarre, another uh, physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, had said that the electron around the core of an atom were more like a standing wave, looking a little bit like the waves on the surface of a pond, and you had to try to make sense of all this. So this because it was very difficult to reconcile this with the classical ideas of Newton. About Newton, I learned other strange things. 
Newton was also studying light. And the idea of Newton is that light was made of particles, a flow of particles going very fast and being diffracted by matter going into water and so on. And another theory which was developed by another physicist of the 18th century, Hoy Hens in, in, in Holland, said that light was in fact a wave, a wave which propagated through space at a large velocity. So the question is, is light particles or is light waves? And until Einstein, everybody believed that Hoy Hens was right, that Newton had it wrong and that light was a wave. But then I was told that Einstein had reconciled, in fact, the two points of view in a very strange way. He had said that light is at the same time a particle, which was called later on a photon, and a wave. And this was very strange, because if you have a classical mind, it's very difficult to see a particle which is localized at a well-defined point in space, and a wave which is completely delocalized. How can you reconcile these two points of view? So this is about what I learned and knew at the end of high school and after two years of prep school after high school. Then, at the age of 19, I was accepted in a great school in France called École Normale Supérieure, which is in the center of Paris and which was founded during the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. So it's a very prestigious academic institution which has taught many, many famous people in science and humanities in France. So I was very glad to get into this school. And then I had charismatic teachers. Claude cohen uh, was teaching us relativity and quantum physics. And he lifted the mysteries I was talking to you about. He explained how Einstein came to these ideas of special and general relativity and he also explains the laws of quantum physics and about the interaction between atoms and light. And I was fascinated by these uh, lectures and then I decided that not only I wanted to be a physicist but I wanted to be an atomic physicist and to learn more about how atoms interact with light. In fact, Electron, photon, and the Moagate, the Pilkondo. Ah, Arta Marpondo, you put the Arta Gila, the Pilkue, Nan Beke, Bere, Visha, and Nitini, Anta, one day teachers of the college of the Dilta, or the Arta Marpondo, other than the research for the K, Kale is said for that. Yatik in the head that is there, Chick Mokleke, you are a guest to famous other Newton, Einstein, Hack famous of Adetara. You famous. I was very lucky uh, to arrive in this laboratory at a very exciting time. It was a time where one started to use light to manipulate atoms, to change the state of atoms, and this was called optical pumping. By irradiating atoms with light, it was possible to orient all the small magnetic moments of the atom in a given direction. And this was done by Kastler and Brossel, who were my teachers at École Normale. I like to show this picture, which was taken in 1966 in the laboratory, the day the Nobel Prize of Alfred Kastler was announced. Kastler got the Nobel Prize in 1966 for the discovery of optical pumping. So you see on this picture, Castler in the center and Brossel who were the inventors of the method. And they were of course very happy about this event. And you see on the right of the picture, Cohen Panuji, who I talk to you about, who later discovered the ways to cool atoms with light and who also got a Nobel Prize. So you see, you have two Nobel Prizes here separated by 30 years. And I am standing on the left and of course at that time I was just a young student and uh, I did not have any idea of what would happen next. So you see that in, in this picture you have three generations of scientists who worked in a very positive atmosphere, an atmosphere of freedom, an atmosphere in which the master trusted the students and gave them the opportunity to blossom and I'm really very, very uh, grateful for that. 
I had another luck at that time. It happened at just after the invention of the laser. And the laser, and you see here a copy of the first ruby laser, is a very extraordinary source of light. Now, young people think that the laser is something commonplace. But nobody had seen light like that in the 1960s. The fact that uh, light can be uh, made so well collimated over very long distances, the fact that light can oscillate at such a regular pace at, with a well-defined frequency and color and be so intense was absolutely considered as a, as, as a miracle. And this has opened very new ways of doing physics and of having atoms interacting with light. And of course, we did not know that, but we had the intuition that very important things would happen. So I will now, in the second part of the talk, talk to you about atoms and light, which was really the center of my life as a physicist. We all know that the world around us is made of atoms. On, on one side, you see a hydrogen atom, which is the simplest one, one electron around the nucleus. Then the next one is helium, where you have two electrons going around the nucleus. And in fact, these two elements, hydrogen and helium, are the most abundant one in the universe. The stars are mainly made of hydrogen, which is transferred uh, 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 in, into helium by nuclear reactions. And uh, from these two elements, all the others are synthesized by a nuclear reaction, and all the elements are obtained by adding electrons one by one to these two. Now, most of the information we receive from the universe comes from light. Light which is emitted by atoms in the stars, and light which is scattered by the atoms around us and which makes us visible. So light is essential as an information carrier, and this is what is fascinating with the interaction between atoms and light. This is the most important phenomenon which is around us. So our eyes is of course very important, but you have a lot of light which is invisible, microwaves, X-rays, UVs, that you don't see, but which are also very important to carry information. And in fact, one can say that understanding the interaction of atoms with light and using this understanding to build new devices is really a very important part of modern technology. So this is at the heart of basic science, which is driven by curiosity, but also at the heart of applications which have changed our lives, that it is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Light is in fact a wave made of an electric field and a magnetic field which is propagating through space at the very large velocity that I told you, C, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, which is about one billion kilometers per hour. It, it means that the light coming from the sun takes about eight minutes to reach the Earth, because the sun is at 150 million kilometers from us. So it's a very fast propagation, and two important parameters, the frequency of the light, which is the frequency at which this field is oscillating through space, which is called nu, and the wavelength, which is the distance it propagates during one period, which is called lambda. And lambda and nu are inversely proportional to each other. Lambda is equal to c over nu. Lambda, the wavelength, which is the distance between two crests of light, is an important parameter because it tells you what is the color of light. In fact, there is a very narrow window in the spectrum which is visible. It is a light which has a wavelength around 0.5 micrometer. But you see that you have light at shorter wavelengths, which is called ultraviolet or X-rays, and you have also light at longer wavelengths, which is called radio waves, microwaves. And Maxwell discovered that you should have all this spectrum. And of course, the invisible light is very important. These waves fill all the space around us. Radio frequency and microwaves are very important. There are the waves which are detected by your cell phones. There are the waves also which are detected by radio telescopes. And in fact, there is a natural source of microwaves in the universe, which is called the cosmologic background radiation, which was emitted 
at the origin of the universe. When the universe was very young, a lot of light was emitted and this light has become microwaves. And these microwaves are detected by radio telescopes. And you see on uh, the, the, the left side of this uh, uh, view of this uh, slide, a picture of the microwave radiation background of the universe. These are false colors which tells you that this microwave background has fluctuations. It is not exactly the same in different directions. And these fluctuations tell us a lot about the history of the early universe. So microwaves are very important. They are also important in devices like the MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging, which makes very beautiful picture of the inside of our bodies. And I will be talking about MRI in one of my lectures tomorrow. You also, of course, have visible light, and I don't have to say much about it, which makes the world perceptible to us. And you have also very short ultraviolet X-rays, which are also important for technological applications. So now the question is, how do light interact with atoms? How do atoms emit and absorb light or scatter light? And to answer this question, in fact, physicists had to develop quantum physics. So in fact, you cannot talk about interaction of atoms with light if you don't say a few words about the story of quantum physics. And this brings me back to the questions I was asking to myself as a young uh, student, uh, and which I talked to you about at the beginning of this talk. And again, we have to come back to Einstein. In 1905, there were two puzzles at least two puzzles about light. The first puzzle was related to the way heated bodies emit light. You, what physicists had found that if you heat a body, even at room temperature, the body is emitting microwave, radio frequencies that you don't see, but you have detectors, infrared detectors, who can see heated bodies at room temperature. If you heat the body more, it will emit more light. And for instance, the sun is heated at 6,000 degrees at the surface. And this explains why the sun is radiating light. And at a given temperature, the spectrum of the light, that is the distribution of the wavelengths that the body emits, obeys to a bell-shaped curve, a curve which has a maximum for a given frequency, a given wavelength and less emission at longer and shorter wavelengths. And if you increase the temperature, this bell-shaped curve is shifted, and the peak appears at shorter and shorter wavelengths. You see here that the maximum at 6,000 degrees, the maximum is in the yellow, and at 12,000 degrees, the maximum is in the blue. And this simple law, experimental law, could not be explained by classical physics. It was really a big puzzle at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Another puzzle was procured by the photoelectric effect. The fact that if you shine light on a metal, the metal will eject electrons. And the way these electrons were ejected could not be understood by classical physics. For instance, if you use infrared light, even if it's very, very powerful, you will have no electron. And on the other hand, a very faint blue light will emit electrons. And to understand that, Einstein found out that the two puzzles could be solved if you admit that light is also made of particles, which later will be called photons. So light is made of bunches of photons, small wavelets propagating through space. The energy of each photon is proportional to the frequency, the proportionality constant being called Planck's constant. So E is equal to H times the frequency nu. And what Einstein found also is that not only these photons have energy, but they also had momentum, the ability to push things if the photons collide with an object. And the momentum of each photon is h nu over c, that is h over lambda, inversely proportional to the wavelengths. You must say that this is very paradoxical. And in fact, Einstein did not like much this idea that he invented, discovered, because a classical mind has a very difficult way of understanding this dualism, how a wave can be a particle. Just to show you that, I show on this slide just a sketch of a very simple classical experiment. If you send a wave 
through a screen which has two slits. You see that what happens after each slit, the wave, a wavelet is produced by crossing the slit, and these wavelets propagate as they interfere. There are some directions in which the wave add up their amplitude. These are bright fringes, and there are other directions in which the waves are opposite in phase. One wave is going positive, the other are negative, and so they cancel each other. So this is easy to understand if you admit that light is a wave. But the question is, how can you explain this for photons? If you make an experiment where the light is so faint that the photons cross the screen one by one, how can you see fringes if each photon has to go through one slit or the other? In fact, I will show you here the, exper the real experiment. You can do this experiment with photons and also with other particles. And again, classically, you understand what happens. Now, I will show you what happens if, when you do the experiment in the laboratory with very faint light when photons cross the slit one at a time. You see, each photon impacts the screen at a given point, and until many photons have arrived, you don't see anything very clear. But after enough photons have reached the screen, you see a very clear interference pattern arriving. So this is a very beautiful experiment which really shows the dualism. Each photon tells us, I am a particle, look, I impinge on the screen at a given point. But statistically, the ensemble of photons tell us, we are a wave, look, we give rise to interference effects. So the big question is, how do photons Arrive, decide to arrive only on bright fringes if they cross the system one by one. And the only answer to this question is to admit that each photon has in some way to pass through the two slits at once. And this is really the most intriguing feature of quantum physics, which is expressed by this equation. The state of the photon is the sum of what would happen if the photon passed through one slit and what happens if the photon passes through the other slit. This is called the superposition principle of quantum physics, and this happens for photons, for electrons, for atoms, for molecules, for everything. It's very important. It means that the, a system, a quantum system, can be in different states at once. And this is what Schrodinger discussed by introducing this metaphor of the Schrodinger scat which is at the same time dead and alive, in a superposition of being dead and alive. And I will talk about this paradox in my last lectures, but I just wanted to tell you this very simply here. After the quantum light came the quantum atom. Niels Bohr, 10 years after Einstein, took again this picture of the planetary atom, but he said only quantized some orbits are allowed. The electron cannot be on any orbit like a classical system. It can be only on quantized orbits with well-defined energies. And when atoms emit lights, the electron jumps from one orbit to the other. It's called a quantum jump. And the energy of the photon which is emitted in the jump should be the difference of the energies of the initial and final orbit state. This explained another mystery about light, the fact that light emitted discrete frequencies, only the frequency, the atoms emitted discrete frequencies, only the frequencies corresponding to difference of allowed energy orbits. You see here that light which is absorbed by a medium made of atoms has discrete sharp shadows at well-defined frequencies. This was observed in the 19th century but could not be explained by classical physics. So just a few on, on this last uh, slide, I give you uh, an explanation about how atoms emit and absorb light. According to Bohr, you see that if you put on a scale the energy of atomic electrons, you have a ground state, which has the lowest energy, which is a stable state of the atom. And then you have, at higher energy, excited states. And the excited states are unstable. When the atom is in an excited state, he wants to fall back by emitting a photon. And usually it occurs in a very short time, about 10 minus 8, one hundredth of a millionth of a second. 
So how does it happen? If you shine light on an atom in the ground state, nothing will happen unless the photon of the light has exactly the energy to bring the atom from the ground to the upper state. So this condition has to be fulfilled. This is energy conservation. A photon disappears and the atom goes to the excited state. And then after a very short time, the atom comes back and this is what is called scattering. Light comes in, the atom is excited and then it emits a photon in another direction. And it is because atoms scatter light that you see the world around us. The light from the sun falls on the atoms and the atoms scatter light into your eye and it is what you see. And the energy is conserved in the process. And just to show you the progresses we made during the last 20 or 30 years, here you see a single atom on the left. This atom is, is excited by a laser and it scatters about 10 to the 8 photon per second that you receive into your eye and you can see a single atom almost with a naked eye. You just have to have a small microscope to look at it. And on the other side you see four atoms. Each atom looks like a kind of bright star. It's a very small object but you can see a single atom now with these techniques. Now the last concept I would like to discuss is momentum. I said that Particles have not only energy, but they also have momentum. Momentum is basically the product of the mass by the velocity. And it tells you what will happen when a particle collides you. If it has a large momentum, it will push you stronger than if it has a small momentum. For instance, if you have two particles which have the same velocity, it is the one which has a higher mass which will have a bigger effect. And if the two particles have the same mass, it is the one which has a larger velocity which has a bigger effect. And during a collision, momentum is conserved. You see the process I described here is a very simple billiard ball experiment. One particle is at rest, the other one has momentum P. They collide. After the collision, the first, the first particle is at rest and the second leaves with the same velocity. They exchange their momentum and momentum is conserved. And this is a process which explains the pressure of a gas. When molecules impinge on a surface, they reflect their momentum and the momentum difference is taken by the wall which recoil and this is the pressure effect. And it is also uh, a process which occurs with photons. You see that when a comet is going around the sun, the tail of the comet which is made of dust particles is pushed away from the sun because the solar photons are exerting a pressure on, on them. So, what is the connection between momentum and wavelengths? According to Newton, the momentum is just a product of the mass by the velocity. According to Einstein for photons, the momentum is inversely proportional to the wavelengths. The, the shorter the wavelengths, the harder the photons are. So, if you identify these two definitions, you find the equation which I wrote at the bottom, and if you solve it, you find that the wavelength is h over mv. And this is what the boy discovered. The boy said that if matter should have a wavelength, this wavelength should be h over mv because of this uh, equation. And this means that the momentum becomes larger and larger when the velocity becomes uh, the, the wavelength becomes larger and larger when the velocity becomes smaller and smaller. So if you want to have observable quantum effects, you need to have very low velocity atoms. And on the next slide, very quickly, I, I give orders of magnitude. If you take one atom, for example, a sodium atom, at room temperature, it has a thermal velocity, it flies at 500 meters per second. And if you put these figures into the wavelength expression, you find that the wavelength is exceedingly small. Something like 10 minus 11 meter, much smaller than the size of the atom. So at this temperature, the wave effects are not observable. If you want to observe interference effects, you need to increase the wavelength, let's say, to one micron. And to do that, you have to divide the velocity by 50,000. Instead of having the atom going at 500 meters per second, they have to go at a velocity of about one centimeter per second. Now, the energy is proportional to the square of the velocity. 
and the temperature which measures the thermal uh, motion of the atom is proportional to the square of the velocity, which means that you have to decrease the velocity by 2 billion to get to this condition, which means that instead of having atoms at 300 absolute degrees, they have to be at a temperature of nano kelvins, exceedingly, exceedingly cold. So how do you get to these temperatures? Again, you use the interaction of atoms with light. You see here an atom which is going on from, from the left to the right at a large velocity. Then you send on this atom photons going in the opposite direction. Each time the atom will absorb a photon and scatter it, it will lose a little bit of its momentum because of this exchange. And each photon against the motion will slow down the atom by a quantity which is written here. So each photon slows down the atom by a very small amount, one centimeter per second. But if the atom can scatter 50,000 photons by a repeated process, which will take about one thousandth of a second, the atom will be brought to rest. If you put now laser beams in all directions, you can slow the atoms wherever the direction is. And this is what I show you here. It is called an optical molasse. And you see here a picture of six laser beams which are converging and at the center you have very, very cold atoms which scatter a lot of light, that's why you have a bright spot. You have here about one billion atoms, each of them moving very slowly and it's called a molasse because it's a kind of viscous motion, a little bit like what you would have these small particles were falling into a viscous liquid. If you want to have atoms in the dark, what you do is to shut down the laser and to switch on magnetic fields which will confine the atom at the center. It's called a magnetic trap of very, very cold atoms. And then you can even get slower atoms by other mechanisms that I will describe in, in the next lecture. In fact, Bose made the initial discovery. Einstein was very much interested in Bose's work and he pursued it and acknowledged the contribution of Bose. So you see at high temperatures the atom behaves as particles. If you decrease the temperature it becomes wavelets and at even lower temperatures they just all condensed in a single matter wave which is a new state of matter, ultra cold, which is the coldest matter ever produced in the universe. And I will describe this Bose-Einstein condensate in the next lecture. So I think it's time to conclude and I would just in a few words and in order to observe and measure it you have it interact with a single atom you send a single atom in this, between these mirrors and then you have the simplest possible situation of light-matter interaction form of matter and one photon which is the simplest form of light but you need special atoms a regular atom would not do you need very excited atoms which have exaggerated features you start from a normal atom, in which the electron is very close to the nucleus, and we think it's like a planetary system, but a, planet, a system in which one planet would go very, very far from, from the core and come back. From the Swedish physicist who computed the energy of these states for the first time, and it's a system which looks very much like a huge hydrogen atom, which is very sensitive to perturbations, and this is the kind of atoms that we prepared. you hear kind of movie which shows how the experiment is going. We have the field in the cavity and atoms crossing all at the time of Einstein, Bohr and Schrodinger because it requires a lot of modern technologies. You need lasers, you need superconducting materials, you need computers and of course these are experiments which we have been able to do just in the last 20 years and I'm sure Einstein and Schrodinger would in Wednesday's lecture and I'll just conclude by giving you a short uh, description in the second lecture, I will talk more about the lasers and tell you how the lasers have really revolutionized physics in the last 50 years. I will, uh, besides what I talked to you about, the atomic clocks having very short light pulses, measuring gravitational waves, which is a very big event which occurred two years ago. All this would have been impossible without the lasers. Magnetic resonance imaging and the related effects. Uh, I know that one theme of this conclave is water. And I have nothing to do with water in my research, except for the fact that 
MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is making the picture of the water molecules that you have inside our bodies. Important element in a human or in a living object, a living system. And so to be able to detect the water molecules is very important in medicine and in re scientific research. And the fourth lecture, as promised, I will focus more on the kind of single particle experiments that I have been doing with my group. That some of these experiments will be helping us in the direction of using quantum phenomena to do quantum information, to improve our ways of computing, communicating, and measuring things with precision. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. With which he has imagined how to create a single photon in a box. That too, what Einstein wanted to create 100 years ago, Einstein did not have all the technologies, the lasers, the supercomputer, or the superconducting materials, and the computation technologies. So, the lesson for you guys who are young, sitting in the audience, is imagine what the problems are that you think is a problem today that you can actually find a solution, say, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. How to take the existing technologies that we have today and create. For example, he could actually trap a photon in a box. Now imagine if you could take that photon and put it somewhere else and create a particle. That is very much like taking a human being, converting him into light, taking him somewhere else and bringing him back into matter. And that is what Star Trek is all about. So, if you can imagine something like that, and if you have the passion to go after achieving it, you become such a generous. So, congratulations. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you in front of us. And, uh, create an ambience for us as to how to imagine to create scientific solutions and how to create scientific solutions that will have technological implications which we are going to talk about. Uh, those of you who know, and it's not just zero and one, it is multiple states of quantum. So that is the quantum computing that is already coming into place and I'm sure you are going to talk about that. I will have very little time for question and answer now, so we will postpone the Q and A to the afternoon. And those of you who have understood most of the talk, please write your questions on a piece of paper, give it to me, and come to today afternoon at two o'clock, and we will have an interactive session with him so that you can answer. Nano, Adarsh, Nanigesh, Tap, Tap, and Jyotish, and Nanigesh, Sulpa, and Hrithini. Because in Sunne, Kuch ko bato, Atta Marpan de Mane ko dare, and Tande Tai kai dare. So they will talk and carry and so I explain about it so that you will have to you will Einstein para, Newton para, Yathara Kelsa Mani dare, Ipatande Shatman dare, take a new girl, Ethara Kelsa Mani, Nam Deshake, Kathy Tarbul. Thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have Professor Sir Tarush and Dr. Sankar Prasad sharing insightful thoughts to the gathering. Thank you, sir. I request to the volunteer to escort the guests off stage. Professor Satish K. Tripathi, President, University at Buffalo, USA, onto the dais. Professor Tripathi holds Master's and Doctoral degrees. <laughs> Professor Tripathi holds Master's and Doctoral degrees in Computer Science that he earned from the University of Toronto and a master's degree in statistics from the University of Alberta. He is the president of the University of Buffalo, part of the State University of New York system. He is recognized as the expert computer scientist. He is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. We welcome you, Professor Satish K. Tripathi, and request you to take over the session. It is really an honor and pleasure to follow Nubulayet, uh, uh, Professor Horesh. Uh, the beautiful talk about physics, uh, the history of physics, and how uh, he has been involved and, and his contributions. And really, it is such a 
nice form for all of us to be able to understand. I did some physics, but that was a long time ago in my undergraduate days, and uh, I followed some of what he taught, but not all of it. But uh, I, I must say that this was really a fascinating talk uh, to go through the history of physics and how physics has changed how we live and what we do in technological form. My talk is slightly different. I'll, I'll take from the passion that uh, Professor Harris talked about, uh, but, but I'll talk about uh, a little bit uh, in terms of uh, uh, the young uh, students here in terms of your goals and how you should fix it and what I have learned in that process myself. So just a little bit of background. Uh, I grew up in a very small village in uh, Uttar Pradesh, which is uh, far away from here, in a village where actually I didn't have access to the books that uh, you heard about, whether the books in astronomy or the books in mathematics, but I had access to some very good teachers who could actually give us the knowledge and could learn something. I am a fourth generation teacher, so my goal always was to become a high school science and math teacher. That was so critical to me. That's what I wanted to be. Maybe become a principal like my father, but really it was to be a teacher. So one thing I learned was that really you got to be have some level of uh, thinking what you want to be. You may not become that. You might change your life. So I actually have three basic principles that I want to talk to you about. One is you set long-term ambitions, but always be ready to change. And I'll talk about that a little bit. It's really important for you to have some ambition. Work towards that, but be ready to change. The world is changing. Be self-reliant, but always seek out opportunities to learn from others. It's so critical. None of us really can understand everything. None of us have the capabilities to, to be able to, to grasp everything. So we got to be able to interact with others as well. The third part I want to talk about is plan strategically and carefully, but be always willing to take risks. So those are the three things I want to talk about. Now, no matter what you want to do, if you want to be a physicist, you're going to take risks. If you want to be a computer scientist, you're going to take a risk because things are changing so fast. Without risk, you're not going to gain anything. But without passion, you probably can never take the risk. So, so really these things are, are very important. And these have served me very well in my personal, professional, and academic careers. And I'm, I'm sure that other people have their own set of principles and, and they serve them as well. They may not serve you, but I think the process by which we all have to go, go through, is important. And, and so this is what I'm going to talk about is my own personal experiences and how I have been able to go where I am today. And I, I want to also say that uh, luck plays a very important role, and, and we heard that from Professor Arash talking about luck and being at the right time. The experiments 100 years ago were not possible that, uh, that we can do today. The same thing really, the luck and the timing is very important for all of us. But those things don't pay off unless we are prepared for it. So really a uh, good solid education to begin with. You know, learning the, the science and math, my undergraduate was in physics, mathematics and statistics. It gave me the solid foundation and I could learn anything else. You know, one of the things you have to remember is what you learn today or what you're learning today or what you're going to learn in your undergraduate days. Probably you're going to forget, but those would be the foundations that will give you the next step, what you want to learn. And that's very true in computer science field. I started teaching in, in 1978 as, as an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, I just had finished my PhD. What I learned during my graduate work or undergraduate work, within a year I had to change all of that. The field was changing so fast that in order for me to teach the course next year, I had to be prepared. So a lot of times people here in the IT industry say that, well, if you're not teaching, 
what the industry wants. We have to remember that if we taught them what industry wants today, they, use, they would be useless tomorrow. So what we have to think about is really to teach them how to learn. As professionals, as educators, our goal is to teach them, or teach you, the students here. As I told you, my, my disciplines were all really in sciences, and I shifted to a totally different discipline. So I was motivated, and I wanted to be a teacher. I was willing to change my course to be a teacher of something different than math and science, although computer science is part of the science and engineering field. But that kind of flexibility was only possible because I had fundamental education. I had learned the maths, I had learned the sciences, so I could learn other things. One of the other things that actually is important to learn is also humanities, which we get very little of in the college here. We get some, but very little. And if you look at the, uh, any large corporation, and if you look at the, the people working in those large corporations, the social sciences and humanities background people, plenty of them at very high posts. The sort of, the, the, the view that you get of the society, the view that you get of the technology, the view that you get of the needs of the society and technology is totally different if you had a good training in humanities and social sciences as well. So I think even if your schools are not teaching, your colleges are not teaching that, try to learn that yourself. I, I did some of that myself because uh, the university has one course in, in humanities that you have, you have to take and that's about it. And we don't get enough of that in our high schools and, and plus two here because very early on, we separate ourselves into these tracks. Are you math track, are you biology track, are you physics track, or whatever track you are on. We get specialized very early on. What I'm trying to tell you is that what you learn exactly in your track probably would be useful, but not very useful as you get to do other things. Some of you are gonna do exactly the same thing what you're learning as uh, Professor Raj talked about. He has been interested in physics, and, but very few of us really will pursue exactly same subject. A lot of us, 99% of us, would be doing things that would be related but not totally concentrated on exactly what, what we learn. So I think it's important to, to be flexible. It's important, as I talked about, the first principle, we have to have goals. So my goal was to be teacher, which I'm still teacher. I don't get to teach as much, one course in a while, you know, once in a while, but still, the goal was to be teacher, and, and I, I am a teacher, and it has served me well. This, but, but as I said before, I always was willing to change, and the change always required this. Actually, not only change in terms of my subjects, but my career as well. So, so first 20 years of my career, I was a regular faculty member. I did a lot of research, in fact, uh, most of you use Google here. One of the founders of Google, Sergey Brin, was in my undergraduate lab at University of Maryland. So we had really very important computer science research. We did work in, in computer science. And then opportunities came to do something different. Now that's a question you have to ask yourself, whether you change your career at any time. Whether you do something different, and that actually comes from your passion in terms of how you want to make an impact and what kind of impact you want to make. So opportunity came for me to establish a school of engineering at University of California, one of the smaller campuses, Riverside. I could have stayed at University of Maryland. I was fairly successful with a lot of money and uh, from grants and eight PhD students and all that working with me, or I could change my career and really get satisfaction for establishing something which is more than my own research. Getting people together to work on real problems. That's about the time when the whole multidisciplinary research was so critical, my research was focused in just one area. And my thinking was, how do I really start 
to make a broader impact? How do I get people together from electrical to computer to materials to chemists coming in? And how do we solve the real problems? Whether the problems are the pollution in the environment, or the problems are the water in, on the ground. I couldn't do all of this as a computer science professor, but I could do this if I'm able to establish a fresh institution. And we have among ourselves Professor M.D. Tiwari who has done similar thing in Allahabad. You know, it sort of started the triple IT Allahabad from nothing and led it for 15 years and that's one of the top institutions in the country now. So really, I'm not saying that I'm the only one that think about that a lot of us want to do something different than just being working for ourselves and, and, and concentrating on that. Probably you can say that I was uh, kind of getting to be a dead wood. Maybe I could not have done research as much as I did early on. But whatever it is, the, the idea is really to how do you make impact and how you get people to work together. And that was a very interesting thing for a boy growing up in a village with no electricity, no water, nothing, to really now convince the people at other institutions to come and join us where I have nothing to show. But the passion and the vision is really important. And you, if you can sell that, you can get the people to buy into that. I think you can do whatever you want to do. Now that School of Engineering is pretty good now. It's, uh, one of the top 50 institutions in, and, and it's only 20 years old School of Engineering. So we did it fairly well and I think I'm, I really felt well, good that I got people together, it just changed my life, it also changed my passion in terms of what I wanted to do rather than being a computer scientist. I wanted to do more work bringing people together and getting them to, to work on the things they are interested in but providing the environment. And that's very important, actually. In an academic institution, the freedom to, to do whatever you want to do is so critical. Whether it's the freedom in terms of uh, freedom of expression, what you want to talk about, or whether it's freedom to do research that you want to do. People talk about entrepreneurship these days a lot. They talk about, uh, you know, people should be entrepreneur and all that. Actually, I say that every faculty member, at least in the U.S., is an entrepreneur. As a young faculty member, you want to do research, you have to write grants, proposals. You have to convince people that your proposal is good to be funded. Nothing dissimilar from convincing other people to put money in a company that you want to start. You have to deliver so that you can get the next proposal. And you have to hire students and postdocs so you can feed them. And now it's your responsibility to make sure the money keeps coming so they actually graduate and they do good work. So entrepreneurship really is a different kind, but it's always as a university professor. So going from one entrepreneurship to a deanship wasn't that hard. It's just that a different kind of job. So, you know, I thought that my job was done and then, uh, you know, the, the sort of risk taking is always there. You know, you, you, you as a professor, or as a scientist, you get to a stage where you have established yourself and you can really do things and continue to do things what you want to do. Somehow there was a bug in me that I want to take some more risk. And I, I joined uh, uh, SUNY Buffalo or State University of New York at Buffalo. It's about 30,000 students now, about 1,700 faculty members. We do almost everything uh, that uh, any major institution does except for agriculture. We don't have agriculture there. And uh, like it's, it's one of the uh, 60 public or private research universities in U.S. that are in the top research bracket and you are only invited to this club known as the Association of American Universities and SUNY Buffalo is one of the members of that six institutions. So it's fairly large and complex institution. It's always, this is really something very interesting as you go in your career find out, it's always easy to establish something new. It may not succeed but it's always easy to establish something new than to change the course of a given institution. 
I told you already about institutions like SUNY Buffalo, established, established faculty members. You can't really make much changes as I came there as a provost, and the provost really is uh, this sort of second in command, does academic aspect of the institution, but also does the budget for the institution. So really, finance and academic are uh, portfolio of the por pro provost. What I wanted there actually to do was to get people to work together in multidisciplinary team. I was able to do that in a new institution. The question is how do you do that in an established institution? And I already told you about the entrepreneurships and independence of researchers in, a, in any good institution. So to change an organization, you have to work bottom up. You have to really think about the faculty and researchers, how they would buy into the thing that you want to do. And really it has to come as their ideas. It took me about a year and a half to get faculty to work together and come up with the ideas. Year and a half plus about $20 million to get to start new things. And we were able to really establish eight new interdisciplinary areas that are concentrated on solving world's problem. Not necessarily, you know, people still do their own research. So think about the physicians still work, we have a medical school, they still work on, on, on their own research the chemists work on their own research, the law professors work on their own research, the management, but you want to bring them on a global health initiative. Public health, how do we bring them all together? So there are faculty members from School of Engineering, from Sciences, Law, Public Health, Social Work and Medicine working together on the health issues, health inequity that exists all over the world. In fact, it exists right there in the city of Buffalo. The city of Buffalo has poor population, population that has no access to right kind of health care. And how do you get, this is a management problem, this is a public health problem, of course the medicine problem, the legal issues, there are technological issues that can really solve those problems as well. So solving the real problem, at the end of the day, our goal really is to make the quality of life better. And how do you get people to work together and do better? So actually, one day somebody asked me, uh, you know, I have served as a department chair, as a dean, as a provost, and as a, as a president now. Somebody asked me, how has your life changed, you know, in terms of jobs? And, and I think for a given institution, the institution is built by the faculty. So I tell them, my life hasn't changed. My job is really to hire and retain the best faculty. As long as, and actually I, I say that because I have been, I have benefited from great faculty, whether at BHU, where I went for college, Banaras Hindu University, whether University of Alberta, University of Toronto, the great faculty, in fact, my faculty in my primary school in the village, where there was no building in the school, we actually learned under the tree, the teachers were fantastic. They actually instilled the idea of learning. They instilled how important these subjects were, how important learning was. So it's the faculty that's so critical for any really top institution and if you want to sustain that. The, the administrators come and go for a few years. They stay there, they go. The students come and go. They come there to learn and the new batch of students come. But it's really the faculty who create that institution. So for all the students, while you're learning, make sure you get the best and as much you can get from your faculty members. It's important really because they know a lot more than you're trying, that, than, than you're getting here. So I, you know, my, my goal really was always to, to think about what I can get from the faculty. And, and that's very important. Let me just say a few words about how things are changing now, just uh, in, in, in the next 10 minutes or so. Things are changing now, and I'm, I'm happy that I'm in that field, that's computer science. Things are changing now because lots of information is getting available. Lots of data is available. 
decision making is getting tougher and tougher because you know not only that a lot more data is there but everyone else has access to the same data so the bureaucrats are the technocrats cannot just say that they've got the best data to make the decision the tools also for the decision making are fairly widely available now so as a student no matter what your subject is you got to think about what other tools i need what else i need to study so if you think about the the amount of data coming you need to at least understand some aspect of data science data science i know is a, is a sort of a bastard word now used by many in different ways but you need to be able to understand the data you're getting how good it is is it good data what does it mean whether you're going to be a social scientist whether you're going to be a medical professional whether you're going to be a scientist no matter what you do you got to be able to understand the data it's not all of it you you know a lot of things you cannot represent in data there's qualitative stuff there as well but in the world that we live in data is important and then of course you got to have some analytical mathematical background to be able to interpret the data again no matter what field you are in even if you are in humanities some level of understanding quantitative and qualitative understanding analytical understanding of data is really really critical you know i i i feel lucky that i really have been trained in in those fields and i did not really start to be trained in computer science but the point is that got a statistical background i got math and i've got computer science for me it has been really easy 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 sailing i i gave a talk uh, at university of toronto the computer science department was celebrating its 50th anniversary and that's one of the oldest departments of computer science think about how how young we are in terms of the departments and they asked me to talk about uh, how the education in computer science and now actually if you look at the aau institutions that's the uh, top 60 research institutions in us there about 10 computer science or computer science related president in those institutions there were very few there were none actually 15 years ago so how does a training in data and in my case in stochastic and uncertain environment that's the statistics coming in how does that give you some level of confidence to make decision decision making is 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 hard and if you wait for the complete information you can never make a decision you know you'll find that whether it's your personal decision whether it's your professional decision you got to make decision with incomplete information